Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me in the locker room today. I'm Alan Locker. Jan Conklin, a producer at Guiding Light, and her real-life husband, the incredibly talented actor Richie Coster, first met in London in 1992 when Jan was a cocktail waitress and he was the bartender in Piccadilly Circus. The couple married in 1994 and made New York City their home in 1996. This year, they will celebrate their 27th wedding anniversary. Jan joined Guiding Light as an intern in 1989 and became Paul Rausch's assistant in 1996. When Ellen Wheeler became executive producer, Jan was promoted and worked as a producer until the show went off the air. After Guiding Light, she spent six years working at Lululemon before joining the nonprofit New York Relief, where she has been working for the past five years as the chief operating officer and is currently serving as the interim CEO. Richie Coster was born in London, England and trained at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. He's usually cast as some scary characters, as criminals ranging from sleazy opportunists to uh, some pretty scary dudes. <laughs> Guiding Light fans will sure recognize Richie from playing Tom Pelfrey's adoptive father, Alfred Randall, and from As the World Turns, where he played Gabriel Frank. He's best known for playing the roles of Dietrich Banning in The Tuxedo, Chechen in The Dark Knight, Elias Kassar in Black Hat, Mayor Austin Chasson in the second season of HBO's hit uh, True Detective and Francisco Scaramucci, Mr. Blue on the sci-fi television series, Happy. He currently can be seen in the HBO hit series, Flight Attendant. Please welcome to the locker room, Jan Conklin and Mr. Richie Coster. Did I get it all right? Hello, yeah. <laughs> wow. So good to see you both. Hey, Alan. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. Take us back to uh, the UK and that Piccadilly Circus pub. What what do you remember? Who who noticed who first? Um, definitely I noticed him first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was visiting the bar one night, and I asked the uh, the the barman behind the bar after he left. I was like, "Who is that guy that was just in here? He was so like grumpy and just dark cloud. I don't I don't." Mm. Why, why, why is he here? Like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Don't like that. I, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, soon after that event, Jan's talking about, I started working there as a bartender. And um, it was, it was like a three or four days of just terror. And I didn't know who was who because everyone there was so American and outlandish and colorful. And about after a week, I noticed Jan and... Um, a week? Well, not <laughs> after a week. I fell in love with Jan. Let's put it on. <laughs> Unlike anything I'd ever seen before in my life. Um, and I remember thinking uh, the specific words in my head. Um, Never before in my life have I wanted something so badly as I wanted Jan. Um, and I courted her for what felt like months, and she just wasn't having it. Um, you had to smile a little. <laughs> yeah, I, it's not in my repertoire. Uh, <laughs> um, God, that was... Well, a, well, I think the casting directors got that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what it is? What about... It, 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 might, be, it might be the problem. Oh, okay. Try a little... <laughs> <laughs> I am a romantic comedy. Jenny's my romantic comedy. <laughs> ah, there you go. And hey, um, does the, do you know if the place still exists? It doesn't. Um, back in the day, like this was so scary because this was early, this was the 90s. Um, and this place that we worked at was dead center Piccadilly Circus, second floor, right there in the center, this you know, iconic place in London. And we were the it spot in central London and like to get like Fridays and Saturday nights, we we're on the second floor and they used to have to turn off the escalators because the line wrapped wow. all the way down the two floors and out the building. So like, you know, we were, we were the ones to come see for whatever reason. Yeah. Places in London get very, very crowded. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. They, and they, um, they last time we were back, def it's definitely not there. Definitely not there anymore. It, it closed as, as usually happens. It was the it spot. Then it became the previous it spot, 
and you know there's nothing so sad as the thing that was the it thing before right. the current it thing so it kind of it dwindled and it died but there was a while there um you know in, in a in our early and mid 20s for me and jam which were formative years mm -hmm. it was uh, it was heaven on earth i mean we worked, we, we drank together, we slept, and then we repeated. <laughs> and we all enjoyed each other so much. It was um, it was a blissful little existence. It's pretty awesome. Do you, do you keep in touch with any others who you worked with there? Um, yeah. Uh-oh, uh -oh, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Uh, come on. Yeah, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Give me one second. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. every now and again, you know how it is yeah. every now and again on Facebook, you, somebody, right. a new friend and, um, you know, sure. develops into something in some point. They're all, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a bunch of people there that I can think of, uh, and I can see them vividly in front of my eyes. You know, I still love them. You know, they, they, those were such lovely times and, and they yeah. loved. I just haven't spoken to them for 20 years. You know? Right. Um, were you always planning to come to the U to the states? No, no. Really, even as an astronaut? Oh, at some point. <laughs> what? Wait, what? <laughs> Let me go back to my childhood. Yeah, it yeah. Was, <laughs> please do. <laughs> I remember being like four or five years old, around this age, four, five, six years old, um, uh, old enough to be cognizant of what America was and okay. its existence. And I would pretend to be American at school. And I'd tell people I was American because I wanted to, to be there so badly. Um, what, what, want, uh, you know, what pr prompted, you know, wanting to be here? Was it acting at that early age or something oh, no, else? No, no. It was, I'll tell you what it was. It was, um, it was a blue sky that I had in a dream as a child. I dreamt of a blue sky um, and it was an American blue sky and the blue sky that we, kind of rarely see over in Britain. Yeah. And I just remember being at school one morning and we were in general assembly, and this is when I'm about five or six years old, and um, we're all sitting on the floor, on the gym floor, and every now and again, you know, at being youngsters, you know, somebody would have an accident and or piss themselves. And um, that, I would say, I remember it was my time to piss myself. <laughs> I, I couldn't get to the toilet, so I, I urinated. <laughs> And as all this <laughs> happened, this kind of ring formed around the kid that had pissed himself. So there I was, sitting in a puddle of my own piss, um, <laughs> looking out the window, and it was a lovely summer blue sky. And I remember looking through the window, and I can see it vividly now, looking at that blue sky, thinking to myself, this doesn't happen in America. This sort of thing doesn't happen to people in America. Um, I found out it does. Right, myself many times since I've been here, <laughs> um, but but that was so strong. But jump twenty years and Jan and I meeting, um, I was living from day to day on this like hedonistic, crazy ride. Uh, I think Jan was looking ahead more than I was. Yeah, I mean, I was I was doing something really intentional at that point, which is crazy to think about it. And it's it's um, what took you to the UK. Yeah, so um, my my junior year of college, I spent abroad, and I was in Scotland. And if you've ever been to Scotland, it is the most expensive oh, place in the entire world. And I was determined, like, I wanted to stay. I didn't even want to come back for my senior year back here in the States. And, you know, I, I eventually did. And I was just determined to get back there. And, and literally three weeks after I graduated from college, I got back on a plane to go back to Scotland. I stopped in the summer to spend the summer in London first. And I fell so in love with London mm -hmm. that I never made it back to Scotland. And like, you know, you have to remember it's so it's so bizarre because if you remember, you know, back in the you know, late eighties, early nineties, when I was making this critical decision of where do I start my life after college, it was New York city or somewhere else. And New York city at the time was just coming out of like late seventies, early eighties, that whole really uh, rough time period here. And, it, and it, the idea of coming to New York city just terrified me. So I did hmm. the next scariest thing and just got in a plane Go to, to London. 
that made sense to me somehow. But I was over there again intentionally. Um, the dollar to the pound was like two to one back then, and I had all of these student loans to pay off. And waitressing in London back then at like the it spot, you made bank. You know what I mean? You made a lot. Mm -hmm. of and I was then being able to convert it two to one, sending it back home, paying off my student loans. And like within four years, I paid off all of my school debt. And when you think of that in relationship to what, you know, students are going through today and like the, the amount of debt and how do you even get strategic or intentional about paying it off, you know? So yeah, that's long answer to that question. And, and but then in 94, you, d you made the decision to come back to the States. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily a decision. <laughs> we had decided that we were going to take a little trip to go see, um, come see the States. Because I, again, as a lot of Americans do, they go to Europe before they've seen much of their own country. Yeah, I, and I, I realized like I hadn't seen anything of the United States. I'd seen more of Europe than that. And he wanted to, to be an American. So <laughs> we... Um, we saved up all summer that year to uh, book like an eight week camping trip across country of the United States, oh, like wow. doing the whole Northern belt camping and then coming down the, the West coast and Southern route back. And so that's, we, we went on this mm, epic cross country camping trip. Got that sounds back, amazing. Got back to New York and then we're like, okay, what's next? You know, well, our, our flat we, and everything was in storage. We got married along the way. We got yeah. to Vegas and we got married. I've heard that. I knew that. I knew that story. <laughs> yeah. Hit the drive through got married in Vegas, <laughs> went back to New York. And then we're like, okay, well, what's next? And well, we and here we are 27 years yeah. later. Yeah. What's next? Well, what? so 27 years. If, if, um, you know, this pandemic is over by the time you celebrate 27, where would your dream be to celebrate 27? Oh, lake. yeah. Yeah. The lake. We have um, this beautiful, gorgeous, just cute, really rustic uh, cottage on a lake upstate. I nice. mean, it's a camp. It's a camp. Uh, the shower's outdoors. At the end of summer, we were taking buckets of water from the lake to flush the toilet like it's rustic it's a shack wow it's a shack <laughs> it's the love shack it is but it's our <laughs> favorite place to be easy that's easy. awesome yeah. that's that i mean that's where you should be i yeah. mean you know if it's you know your anniversary you should be doing is there a childhood book tv show or movie that had a large impact on your life oh i know yours do you know mine I know yours. I know yours. What's mine? Uh, um, <laughs> any crappy 1980s music video. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of, when, when she was giving me the background, she she did your whole love story to the human leagues, you know, don't don't you want That's me, right. baby? He's so right. He's so right. Like, I didn't read books. My entire life was a music video. MTV and, and you just come out. It was like you, you sent me your story to the Human League. <laughs> um, yours is Star Wars. Mine's Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I, I, uh, the day that Star Wars was first released in London, in England, in 1977. So yeah. I was there in the line. I think I saw the second showing of Star Wars and um, that changed existence for me. And in a very long, circuitous route, which would take me about 40 minutes to describe, I shall begin. Um, it, it That made me want to be an actor. That that, 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 that was going to be my next who or what influenced your, oh, wow, so it was Star Wars. Well, it was, yeah, it was Star Wars, which made me want to be a, an astronaut until I was um, about 15, 16 years old. Oh, so that wanted you to be an astronaut, not an actor. Well. Or both. <laughs> that wasn't quite part of reality. I did, whatever it was, <laughs> I didn't want to be here. I wanted to be there yeah. a long time. Yeah. Ago. You wanted to be flying on the X-Wing fighter. The Millennium Falcon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at 15 and 16, I realized that to become an astronaut, you have to like 
work at stuff. Um, so I changed my mind and, and I thought, oh, well, I, I can get to be in, in spaceships by being an actor. Uh-huh. And it's yeah, happened. You, cer- you, cer- you certainly can. You really, really can. So I'll get to like Guiding Light and all that stuff. But when Richie joined Guiding Light, what role were you in, Jan, for the first time when he first got there? Um, the, the, well, the first time they tried to get him there. I right. Was, well, we'll yeah. ask that. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to get to that later. <laughs> so, yeah. The first time I was an associate producer, I was doing the scheduling. By the time he came as Alfred, I was a producer. Gotcha. And yeah. was it fun to work together? Yeah. It, yeah, it's fun. You know what I used to love? I used to like the commute in. Yes. We would drive in at Just the time. I, was say. I know. Yeah. It was so fun. Um, we'd drive in, we had a little stint, we had a little two year stint in the suburbs and we'd drive in together and it was so fun because, you know, I was just doing that myself and for six months we got to do it together. It was a blast. That's fine. A long, you were doing it for a long time by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and that was lovely. And then we'd, 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 we'd get coffee and then we'd walk into the building and we'd, we'd split to our separate departments. And, um, that's for sure. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and we'd. And I was his boss, technically, which was kind of fun if you're married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was an actor, so obviously I was the boss of everything. Yeah, I love that. Jan, did you grow up watching soaps? I did. I did. I mean, I think much like you, I could not wait for, like, February break to come, spring break, mm-hmm. um, summertime. Uh Christmas break, I got to college, you were registering for your classes around what time like General Hospital was on. Like, I mean, yes. Right, like, b- before DVRs and before totally. VCRs, yeah. Oh yeah, I was days, of, well, see I was Days of Our Lives, Another World, The Doctors, um, all of the NBC shows because growing up when I did, um, we only had one channel. <laughs> In the 90s, really? Stop it. <laughs> um, yeah, where I lived, you had the three networks. That was it. And we had a black and white TV, but we didn't have cable. So we had one channel. One channel. So hence another world and all of that. But so then when I like, you know, we had cable for the first time and could watch. And how did your internship come about? Um, that was, oh my gosh, that was so awesome, man. Um, I, you know, I selected my school based on the fact that they had this, this really thriving college internship program. And I knew, you know, I came from a really small town and I knew, man, I, this is my ticket out. I'm going to college. Um, they've got an int like chances are I'm going to end up somewhere other than back home. Right. And, uh, I, I just went through the TV production and uh, internships and I, I went to, as the world turned and interviewed all my children guiding light and I received two offers, but it really was the, the guiding light um, environment that, that, that we were known for was so tangible, even, you know, as an intern walking into interview that, that, that reception that I received was the deciding factor. So interesting. So your school set up all these interviews with all of those daytime shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That, that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. And, that's- yeah, and that's why I was, you know, I was very specifically choosing this college. They've got this great program. Look what I could possibly do, you know, and away I went. Interesting. Yeah. And, and the, crazy. I mean, and, and one thing to just say out loud, you know, for sure, for anybody watching and in college, in, get an internship. Get an internship. <laughs> get an internship. It opened every it opened every door for me, basically. It did. And, you know, it's so funny because I managed the internship program here uh where or here at new york city relief where i work now um and it's the thing that i'm the most passionate about because there's nothing nothing more rewarding than opening that door for somebody coming out of school that's that's so confused they don't know what to do the pressures the this the that and if you can teach them you know this level of excellence and really valuing the moment that they're being given um, especially when it's New York City, it's like you—if you can make it to New York City, that cliche, you can make it anywhere. And it's so so interesting because you, you know 
I asked you about your internship and and told you, you know, for me it opened doors, but I I created one at when I worked at Disney, a college marketing program. Right. At different colleges across the country. And I'm still friends with people who are now still working for Disney like 30 years later because I gave them that opportunity. Wow. Yeah. It's you know, and it, it, you know, just hearing you say that out loud, I, it, it really is something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where did you intern? Um, I so I I actually became a page at ABC Television wow. when, I, when I was in college, and then I interned for Regis and Kathy Lee, and they gave me a job right out of college, and I'm still friends with Kathy Lee to this day because of that internship That's and so and that page position. Yeah, but I used it, you know, it like Jan did. I wanted to be in this business. Yeah, so I. I, I was watching everything. I was asking questions. I was meeting people so that I hopefully could open those doors for myself if, you know, if yeah, an opportunity presented itself. Exactly. Taking that experience you have and using it to create an impression because that impression will serve you going forward should you wrap back around. Like in my case, I run off to Europe and I decide to like wait tables and, and meet him and have fun for five years, which I highly recommend coming out of college. And, I wish um, I did that. That's one of the only things, Jan, um, studying yeah. abroad, I did not do. Yeah. I wish I had done. Yeah. And um, when I came back, so when I circle back around and it's seven years later that I'm landing in New York City, the first phone call I make is to Guiding Light saying, hey, I'm here. I want to, I'd, I'd love to show my, you know, resume. And, and they were like, oh my gosh, of course, you know, because they remembered the uh, experience, the, yeah. the precedent you had set for the level of work you were going to be capable of delivering. That's an important thing. And um, they remembered me. They called me in instantly. And turns out um, somebody, they needed a temp. And I was literally 24 hours later temping for them just from picking up the phone call phone and saying, Hey, do you remember me? Blah, blah, blah. And they were like, of course, you've got to pay attention to the, the, the wake you leave. And uh, also this is something Jan also talks about a lot, which is that, um, and I found this, I, I don't know if you, if you, if you recognize this, Anna, but our business, you know, whatever we're doing in it, yeah. people kind of get the impression that we kind of stumbled into it or we were just discovered waiting tables like that, or, um, sure. you know, it just happened. And people say, yeah, I'd love to get into the business. And you ask, well, what are you doing about that? Uh, I don't know. I'll do it. Same right. I'll, well, I'll do it next week. Yeah. This business, like so many, is populated people like yourself that knew they wanted it from a very young age and were placing those bricks on top of each other you know, all the way through there. You have to say it out loud, you know, because for me too, I was going to college to be an accountant, you know, or, or that's kind of where the, I thought the major would go. And I was, because I had, a, you know, my parents didn't have money and I worked from 13 on, I was working at a health club and having a lovely conversation as I was managing the pool area. And, you know, a woman asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I'd love to get in the entertainment business. And another woman happened to work in uh, HR at ABC and said, why don't you give me a resume? You know, we have a page program. Yeah. Boom. Boom. You know, but you have to, you know, voice those things, you know, make it, you really do have to make it happen. You yes, have to make those do. things. Yes, do. You have to make those things happen. What, I mean, what, just picking up the phone. It's the prepared. Say it again. Is it? Is that the phrase? Providence favors the prepared. Yeah, probably. Yeah, really. Think about that. It now is a phrase. Providence favors the prepared. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to coin it to Richie Coster. Yeah, Richie. Were you, so, did you work much in the UK before you came to the US? <laughs> um, no, acting wise, no. I know you were where you met, but I meant acting. You were a turtle. Yeah, that was my a first turtle. Turtle. <laughs> I was, I was In turtle. what? What is it? He got hired to be an act like a turtle at the London Zoo. Oh, jeez. I was definitive. Didn't you do a <laughs> pantomime? No, it was uh, it was Aesop's Fables performed twice daily uh, in the amphitheater at London Zoo. It was my first job, and it was a miserable, miserable time. Um, but that's kind of how it... That's kind of how it was for me back in England because I'd, I'd maybe get one job a year 
like a walk on on the English soaps or a play maybe and it just wasn't happening for me there and um, um, actually when I joined that um, that bar where I, where I met Jan it was part of a decision on my it was part of a decision on my part that you know what being being a bartender and you know living a fantastic hedonistic lifestyle and making some money is a lot more fun than just being an unemployed actor <laughs> so i gave yeah. it up you know but here's what can i tell can i tell the story can i tell a story so here's yeah, of course here's the really fun thing and i do not mean to offend anybody um i'm just very opinionated um and that's my problem <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I i have no then, idea where this is going so so you know, go back. We, he he joins the. He's a bartender in the restaurant. The the, the place that I'm at. Um, we, we're interested in each other, and and the restaurant industry. And it's true today. Is full of wannabe actors, dancers, singers. But going back to the thing, like you have to want it every single day. You have to get up thinking about it, eating it, sleeping it to make it happen. You mm -hmm. can't kind of sit back in that. Um, restaurant job that pays money and, and think it's going to happen for you, right? Um, you have to be super intentional about the choices yeah. you're making. So I'm I'm around actors all the time, right from, you know, being in the wait, waitering uh, industry. And we sit down one night at a bar to have a conversation. And he tells me that he's booked this gig out of town. It's when you got the offer for Trilby and Svengali. Mm -hmm. And he's going to go on the road on this this national tour, and that hadn't come up yet. Like I just assumed he was a legit bartender, bartender, not an actor wannabe bartender. And I sat there going, "Fraggle Rock, he's an actor. Oh God, why? Did, like I thought you were a bartender. He's one of those actors that's going to, so, you know, because everybody thinks has these dreams they're going to be an actor, and so." Fast forward, I go to see him on the road because he immediately leaves and goes on the tour. And I see him on stage in this play and I was like, oh crap, no, you're, you really are an actor. Like he was the real deal. And I knew from that moment I saw him on stage, he was gonna have a career, hands down. Like I, I did it, I have, we're just drunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But like I knew instantly um that something big was going to happen for him. I mean, he just like leapt off the and it was just it was really breathtaking to see him for the first time as an actor. I bet. I mean, when you're dating someone and to see them. Um so arriving here in the states was it difficult? For you, Richie? You know, no, I mean, I I I officially in my in my head i was no longer an actor i was a bartender and so our vacation came to an end and and we decided to to stay here and we settled down for a couple of years in a town in upstate new york and i got a job in in a bar and um i i drank a lot and i tended bar and i slept so basically i was I was happy as could be, you know. Yeah. I was doing the same thing I've been doing back in England just transplanted me across the 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 um the Atlantic and to the to the blue sky. To the, the blue, blue sky, sky. yeah. <laughs> and uh, things were fine and um and um after a couple of years we we moved down to Manhattan <laughs> to give it a try and I was tending bar and a friend of a friend was sitting at the bar who uh, found out I used to be an actor and, and introduced me to their agent. Um, so, you know, again, it was knowing somebody and a stroke of luck and being in the right place at the right time. Um, and that can happen too. It can. Uh, I mean, just like, right. Just like I said, I mean, I was talking at the pool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it can happen, Alan, but the, the distinction is Someone can open the door, but you have to walk through it and you have to claim it after that. Cor correct. Expects the door to be open. They're, all they're doing is opening, right? That's you all have to, that's happening. Yeah. Right. If you didn't succeed you in the internship, they wouldn't it. have called you back. Mm -hmm. Right. For you, Jan, they wouldn't have called you back. Yeah. When, you know, if you didn't succeed in that internship, you know, you do make an impression on an internship. 
Yeah. And for Richie, I mean, we had been in New York City three months. He wow. had a job. I had a waitressing job because that's, you know, how we knew to like get up and started. Within three months, this happens and he is out of the gate and he's doing an off Broadway show. And three months after that, I'm out of the gate at Guiding Light. Like it, it just, you know, it was meant to happen here because it happened so quickly once we landed. Yeah, Manhattan agreed with us. Are you happy that that man made or woman made that introduction? Um, me? Yes. Oh, to yeah. If, if that hadn't happened, I mean, at this time I'm thinking I'm, I'm in Manhattan. Maybe I should get the acting thing together again. The thing is, I, I'm, I'm not particularly a man of imagination and I, I didn't, I didn't know the ropes. I don't know what I, I could have been banging my head against the brick wall for the rest of my life trying to get into the business. So and crazy. I love that, that just, and that man opened the door. Oh, and your first thing, the first thing was an off-Broadway show from well, that moment? It was an off-Broadway show, but when it was originally offered to me, it was gonna be an out of town tryout and then transferring to Broadway. Um, wow which was great and to celebrate we went back to england to see my family and tell them and, and celebrate and a week later we came back and somebody had had an argument with somebody and it was no longer a broadway gig but it was now it was just an out of town the business out of town yeah. that then came back and transferred to off broadway that's yeah. such the business totally the business so, Jan, when you did your inter internship, you told me, so that was during Sherry Stringfield, Michael Zaslow, Jean Carroll, Michelle Forbes, yeah. Brian Buffington, who is watching right now, and Rachel Minor. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're going to be uh, here next Friday, oh, Brian, so and Brian and Rachel together. That's um, so fun. And he just, he texted saying he, he wanted to do what I said I, you know, regretted that, you know, study mm. abroad. Yeah. What was it like being at Guiding Light with all the, you know, I mean, that that was a heyday for sure. Oh, my gosh. It was like, it was so, I mean, that's. Had you watched it yet? Um, I had, I had watched it to do my homework. But again, like I wasn't raised on CBS. So I didn't, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't really have the background, but like I certainly from the, from the second I knew I was applying, I, you know, did my homework and it was such an easy one to get into. But um yeah, I mean, like you're coming off of you know, mid eight. You're you're talking about like that mid eighties heyday, and it was you know it was incredible. I'm joining just as um, they're going off to Florida to shoot Kim Zimmer and the Riva going off the bridge. Like it was wow, yeah, and it, it was just so exciting. And you were really a part of something you know big that was that was you know. I think Giovanni Cucciolo from Italy, I think, is saying hi, Jan and Richie, and good night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lucina's mom is watching. Nicole, say hello to her. Who's watching? Who's Richie's mom? Where are you? I don't... He can't see the comments. Who's... He can't see. I can't... Oh. Who's Who's watching? Noli, uh, I love you. And I love is that you. Your mom? Mom? Did you say your mom's watching? Maria Messina's mom is watching. Oh, lovely. We love her. Oh, that's awesome. Sorry. I'm just smiling at her now. <laughs> I'm sitting here and smile at her because I adore her. So, Jen, uh, working for Paul Roush was your first. <laughs> As an assistant to Paul Roush. Yes. I mean, that, we. I mean, did you have any idea? So w when you were an intern, who was the EP? Uh, Bob Calhoun, right? Okay. So not, right. So you didn't really, so did you have any idea of the the legend Paul Roush? Oh, I had no clue. But here's the thing. Like, it was really funny because I start temping, right? And it turned into like somebody needed a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off for a funeral. I take that gig. Then before I leave on Friday afternoon, they say, we actually have another two weeks we need to book for somebody else that's going on vacation. I think it was Jem Pepperdine, maybe who had been Michael, Michael Labeson's assistant, something like that was happening. And they said, we need somebody to sit out with Michael Labeson for two weeks. And so like I took that gig and um, Michael Labeson was let go while I was his assistant temp. And then we sat for six weeks 
without an executive producer and they needed somebody just to be sitting out at the desk. So they hired me for six weeks and they said, just sit out the desk until everything gets sorted out. And like the running joke was who's the new executive producer. And it was like, Oh, the temp sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then it takes them six weeks. Paul Roush is coming in. He comes through the door, um, but he comes without an assistant. So they booked me for two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, you know, he, you know, called me in and he's like, you know, they passed on. With, with his cigar. All right. He's like, so kid, you want a job? <laughs> you know? I'm like, yes, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, that was it. We were. You must, uh, I mean, you must have learned a lot from him. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm a tough cookie. So I just refined a few skills and, and we were good to go. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah. So I, I don't know what. What year did you, uh, Richie, go in for that first role that you turned down for what movie, Jen? You remind, I forgot. They wanted you and you booked Rear Window. Rear Window. Rear window. Christopher Reeve did the remake of Rear Window. Right. It was Rear Window. So did you go through the whole uh, audition screen test process mm -hmm. at Guiding Light for that first role? No. Um I'd met, um, um, was it Glenn at the time or I'd met, I'd, I'd met Glenn um, and I met Paul a few times and he took some um, mysterious shine to me. Well, he went, <laughs> Paul went to me, you had opening night of Dealer's Choice at Manhattan Theater Club. Mm -hmm. Paul invited himself as my guest. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's and, a good way. So smart I, wifey, smart classic, wifey. Like, classic. And he went with me to opening night and he saw Richie. And as that thing happens, like you see an actor and the next time, next day you're going into the soap opera saying, Oh man, we got to write a role for this guy. Well, that's how Betty Ray used to do it. Yeah. She used to go all the time. I mean, I'm sure Glenn and Rob did the same thing, but I yeah. know like Betty always went to the theater. Yeah. Yeah. But especially when you're in the, the situation of executive or, you know, the writers and you see theater, you, you end up, they, they become a muse and inspiration for a role. And that's it, the second time when it happened, um, it was Jim and Barbara were, um, Richie was doing wait until dark on Broadway. He was Quentin Tarantino's understudy. He got to go on Jim and Barbara came with me to go see him in his Broadway debut. And it was, it was the same thing. We're like, oh my gosh, we got to write a role with this guy. Like, so like if you're in that situation, that's what happens. Alex and Jill are watching. You just made Alex laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for, for the fans watching, Richie was almost cast as Prince Edmund Winslow, but he took a, you know, he took a movie role instead. Um, but we got lucky. We got him in, you know, we got David and then we got you to play Jonathan's father. Yeah. What a lovely job that was. That was just a <laughs> lovely gig. Uh, yeah, not not a bad gig and, and not a bad guy to work with, right? Yeah, Tommy's, um, uh, he's basically, Tommy's going to be one of the people that are sitting at my deathbed. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, he's that oh. close a friend. And um, he's. Um, Had, I, I assume you met him through Jan prior to. Yeah, yeah. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, nice enough, cocky kid. And Jan was telling me, you know, stories of how fantastic he was. And this is when he used to go around the studio with this big bag with the boa constrictor in it. And like coming, I'd come home and I tell Richie, I'm like, you got to meet this kid. Like, A, he's crazy. B, he's phenomenal. And he's got a boa constrictor and he walks. I think there's something you two just kind of seem like you would jive. I don't know why. <laughs> so funny. We, we knew it too. in in pub, you know, the PR department about Tommy, we, you know, we've had a lot of actors come through the doors, but for that one, we really like, we knew he'd be the up and coming. And we, we set out to try and pitch that because you could just see it. You yeah. know, oh. I mean, this is not to belittle the training that he had. And the preparation no. that we put into it, but um, like he's the real article. It, like he came out of the box as an actor. And the truth is, oh. I've never met an actor with the emotional access and the 
uh, devotion to honesty mm. that, that Tom Pelfrey has, which is serving him um, better and better as time goes on. I mean, he's doing great for himself and his work's just getting better and better. Yeah, cra crazy. Um, was that your... You did you do um, as the world turns first or guiding light? I, uh, as the world turns first, yeah, that first. was a few years. So ago. prior to that, had you done anything in daytime? So I mean, I know from Jan, you probably knew it was hard work, but I did you know, uh, two days on all my children. Yeah, that's what I was gonna yeah. say. Yeah, I think it's all my children. Yeah, yeah I was uh, I was an Irish terrorist for two days on all my children. Um, uh, when I did As the World Turns, uh, that's when I learned to um, that's when I learned to respect the medium. Um, and having learned that, by the time I got to Guiding Light, I understood the medium a little more and started to understand where its freedoms were, um, where its ex exuberances were, the the place there that you that you not only serve the story, but get to expand and shine a little. Um, mm. But yeah, but, but, but the jobs previous to that, it was, it was all a mystery to me. And, and uh, I was a little snobbish about it to tell the truth, but doing it, I learned what hard work it is and, and what skilled storytelling it is. And I, I remember, I mean, Alfred had some di dialogue for sure. Yeah, yeah. You had, you had a lot of stuff to learn playing that role. Funny enough, it's as I always say, it's, learning the stuff is learning the stuff is the easiest bit of the job. Filling the stuff is is the hardest bit. Um, but yeah, the doing a day and then knowing that you've got a full day the next day and then thereafter. I mean, that was kind of the joy of it for me because what. Yeah do love about working is that sometimes you can just disappear into the job, into the bubble of the work. It's going back to that life Jan and I led at the bar, which is where you work, you go and drink and then you sleep. But, mm. um, but sometimes with a job, you work, you go home, you learn the lines for the next day. Maybe you hang out a bit with the rest of the cast and then you sleep and then you repeat and you disappear into that bubble. And um, you can't do it for the whole life. But sometimes just having that for a little while, it's just a wonderful way to exist. So working hard was never a problem. Um, and, and then in that role to get, you know, the added friendship of, you know, the person you're working opposite, you know, with Tom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a bonus. My peeve every now and again would be we'd be doing a scene and, and you know, here's Tommy firing on all cylinders with his – immaculate open and emotional actor <laughs> and here's this like big english hand just trying to pull a face that i haven't pulled in the last 10 minutes um sometimes i <laughs> sometimes i wanted to say to him oh stop it <laughs> no stop stop being so damn good for god's sake just fake it like the rest of us uh he's not lacking for work that one at the moment no no Ozark. It's yeah. Um, Jan, talk about your funniest moment. Oh, the ball thing is the no, 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 at Guiding Light. What did I say it was? Is that um, the Emmys? Oh, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, that was horrifying. Um, so you know, you we how many of those things did we do year after year and season after season and and um the red carpet and getting dressed and blah blah and you know I'm like I just want to be behind the scenes I want to do my job I just want to get on with things but you know there are these other things that you do and um I'm we were si sitting in the theater they're getting ready to make the announcement. We've been overlooked for so long and we've been nominated a couple of times. You, you just, you get to the point where you've got, you've got nothing invested in it. We're just happy to be here. Right. And I think, I, yeah, I think I told you, I think I brought a $25 dress from Marshall's. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is the best. My shoes were off. 
I didn't even know where my purse was. You're kind of in a slump and you're like, oh, I'm just, I'm comfortable. My shoes are off. You know, I didn't go too far with the dress. So I'm con all of it. And then you hear your name called and you're like, holy crap. And the shoes that I had off weren't easy to go back on. And like, I'm trying to like jam my shoe on and, and everybody's leaving for the stage and Ellen and Maria and Alex. And I, I'm still like trying to jam on my shoes and I'm throwing my purse at him saying, oh, this. It was just, it was a catastrophe. It was just terrible. And we, we, de we definitely had some good moments. I'm going to stick with Jan just quickly so I don't forget. No. Um, because <laughs> I know she's got a jet right at the end. Um, your proudest moment, which, you know, is mine as well, or the, you know, the most rewarding experience of my 12 and a half years there. Mm. Yeah. Talk about finding, finding, finding that out. Yeah. I mean, um, the find your light campaign. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, like when I think about the full circle moment of so many things in life and where I am today and what I'm doing, um, when Ellen asked me to, you know, produce the 75th anniversary campaign and, and we started working 70. 70th. Yeah. 70th <laughs> campaign. Um, and calling it find your light and then just doing the work that we did on it to put it together. Um, it's, it's so it's, it's surreal. It's really surreal. Um, because now I'm working in the nonprofit world and yeah. it was just such a beautiful moment. It was such a privilege to do that, that whole year. Um, we worked our butts off because Four, 14 years ago, last month. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we were, um, going out once a month to shoot these segments as well as the three houses in Biloxi, as well as shooting five shows a week, like not for nothing. But we actually just FYI, we were in Atlanta this week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this and week, 14 years ago. That's Atlanta. crazy. I just, Atlanta. Him, by the way, the other day with John Jowers, I don't know if you remember him. From <gasps> yeah, I know. I was talking yeah, I, about some other business and Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But going back to your funniest moment, I now I'm remembering what happens to tie the two together. So we've just, you know, had this year of like working like crazy, producing the show, going to Biloxi, shooting every weekend. And then the Emmys come when I finally get my shoes on and make it to the stage. And I'm standing there with Maria and, and Alex behind Ellen. And she's at the podium accepting the uh emmy for us and she's making this announcement spontaneous announcement in the moment and we're going to take this to thank our viewers we're going to take this emmy on the road and we're going to visit a household every once a month to continue this celebration and like where the three of us are looking at each other going oh my god we're going back out on the road like we're so exhausted <laughs> and we're like oh oh here we go yeah we're yeah we're taking that emmy to households every month <laughs> Yeah, the Find Your Light was really something special, you know. And we also met so many people around the country. But um, I want you to, I want you to talk about New York Relief, and I put it up. It's up on oh, the screen. Yeah, New York, yeah, New York City Relief. So we are, um, we are a Christian, a faith-based nonprofit. We work here in New York City. We have been around for thirty-two years, uh, and New York City Relief runs mobile outreach units that we take um, to eight different locations in New York City and New Jersey. Um, the New Jersey metro area, uh, just connecting people that are struggling with homelessness to to resources, um, getting them connected. You know, we we start by food distribution, like that's the draw. Like, come come have some hot soup with us. Come have some hot chocolate in in the winter. And but the goal is to get into a conversation and you know build trust, build relationships, and then start getting them connected to the things that they need to start this journey out of homelessness. You know, when, when you think of it, you don't just like wake up one morning and oops, you're homeless. There's a series of events that snowball, that, you know, land you in that situation. And so the, the reverse route is as complicated, if not more so. Um, and so it's starting to journey along with people uh, for as long as they'll have us. And, and sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll meet somebody and, and they'll take you up on your offer of help right then and there. And, and sometimes we're spending six months to a year 
building trust through consistency and reliability to um, get them to let us help them out. And we're seeing much more homelessness now during this pandemic, right? Yeah, you yeah. Um, and you haven't seen even like the reality of what's coming. Like New York City before the pandemic was in its own epidemic with homelessness. Um, it was, I, I remember. 70,000 people in, in New York City alone, 70,000. Now, what you have- Before the pandemic, there were 70,000? Oh yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Wow. So you have 70,000, right, before the pandemic. What you have now in New York City is you have 14,000 households that have fallen behind in the rent by two to three months. And the average rent at that income level is around $1,600 a month. So start doing some math there. 14,000 households, three rent payments at a $1,600 a pop. You're talking about billions of dollars for just that issue alone. And the people that are collecting rent, like these aren't households that are in these, you know, big, pretty sky right. high towers. That $1,600 a month is somebody else's income, right? So the spiral effect, we haven't even seen what's coming. Like it's, uh, we, there's a lot of work ahead. It's, it's, it's what's coming. Mm -hmm. We need do a lot. You know the, do you know the organization Chrysalis in California? I don't, I don't. I think they're a homeless organization. Mm -hmm. I, I might be doing it. Some folks asked me to do something to help raise money for them. So we might do something, but mm -hmm. we should, you know, see if I'm still doing this down the road, we should try yeah. and do something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, Jill and Alex both said they had their shoes off or, or Jill had her shoes off and Alex said, at least you didn't trip. Uh, well, this is true. I didn't. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Richie, do you have a favorite role? TV, movies, film? Uh, sorry, TV stage or film? Um, and I know that might be hard to choose. It's 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 a tough one. I th I think it's stage. I I understand working on the stage a lot better than I understand working in front of a camera. That still eludes me. Um, I think it's. And, the, and in 2018 and 2019, you worked. You had two great stage roles. One 2018 with Oscar, uh, Oscar Isaac, and then Peter Dinklage in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's that? and it's so much it's so much fun, and that's one you you really do disappear into it, and, and especially if you're getting on with all your castmates, it's it's you know it's a, there are times it feels like a state of grace. It's um, however, I'm going to still plug away at this camera and screen. I'm going to get it. Well, uh, I, I, when when I wrote out that question and I wasn't looking at my my list. I actually said I know that they pay more on this the other, but I assume stage would be the uh, choice. You know it, what you love, but of course, you know we all go where the money is. Um, yeah. and the, a the trick is for me is is um, you know I've I've over the years I've refined my my process, and it and it's all about joy. Um, sometimes the trick with me is working in front of the camera is, is, uh, to remember to, to find the joy of the moment. Um, hmm. uh, you know, it comes down to the question, if you're not enjoying it, why are you doing it? Um, I, and what, if, if you feel, if you're feeling joy in it, then suddenly you get a lot better as well because you have a lot of different areas open up. So does this does the audience bring you that joy is that is that yeah, they do and, and they do the opposite as well sometimes audiences make me furiously <laughs> angry <laughs> not even that with their coughing with their coughing <laughs> and they're damn looking at each other and, and or, or 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 you know or this. <laughs> yes <laughs> or not remaining permanently on their feet all the way through my performance. <laughs> Great pearls before wine. That's what I always say. Um, oh my God, that is fantastic. What's your favorite stage role you've done? I think it would be what I did in Hamlet uh, um, uh, with Oscar. 
Um, I forgot Claudius. Um, okay, so you just made me think because I was when I was going to mention Oscar, but Star Wars. Yeah. What I mean, what was that? Because oh, you must have liked that movie. Well, it, it was it not emotions. Um, say, it again. say it again. It was a mix of emotions. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, a long time ago, about 15 years ago, I did a play, uh, an off-Broadway play uh, with Oscar, who was not long out of college back then, and with oh. a fellow, a lovely actor called Pedro Pascal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, we would wow through in this play. And Oscar wow. was marvelous things and became Poe Cameron in the Star Wars universe. Pedro went on to lots of marvelous things and became the Mandalorian. The, Mandalor the Mandalorian. One of these three things is not like the other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't point it out, Jan. Don't point it out. Um, there's still time. A very small man. There is still time, and they are producing a lot. But um, you, you know, the the only way, the only reason I forgave the universe for not giving me a job on Lord of the Rings was by <laughs> saying, "Oh, it's, it's all right. They'll pick me up for Star Wars at some point or other." Um, so yeah. interesting that Star Wars had such a large impact, though, and you've worked with both of those men. Mm. Yeah, yeah, which is, it is. It's a, you know, a, a smaller man than me would be very angry and bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like The Mandalorian? Oh, we haven't done the second season, but the first season was Fantastic. lovely. Fantastic. Yeah, and the second one was great. I think it you'll. Was yeah, I think you'll. Enjoy it. Yeah. I'm I'm very much a Star Wars like you. I mean, I was 10, 11, I think, when it came out. So it, really? It was, yeah. I didn't I didn't think you were that old, man. I am. <laughs> <laughs> this year will be 55, baby. Wow. Oh, hell, right? Shut up. Are you serious, I, Alan? I, I, I sadly I am sadly I am. <laughs> wow. I want to look like you in 15 years when I reach your age. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Um, what's next? You're, well, I know you're off to Georgia, and you can't talk about that, but that's exciting. Yeah, I'm off to Georgia. We're off to Georgia because and, we're all going. Yeah, uh, to quarantine. and you have to quarantine, right? Yeah, quarantine. And um, I signed an NDA, so I can't say what it is, but yeah. They'll, they'll, whoever it is, they'll announce it at some point. So yeah. that's exciting. Yeah. And it's in Georgia. And it's in Georgia. Yeah. Where they film things. Things. Lots of things. Maybe. Georgia's really be Georgia's become like the you know New York or you know California. They have great tax incentives. Have you? When was the last time you were in Georgia? Uh, was it Jan? Was it Atlanta when we went? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I travel through Atlanta airport all the time. Yeah. But well, that's how you have to get to most cities, to most in, cities in Georgia. Right? But yeah, it's been since then, which is crazy. Yeah. I've got a brother crazy. down there myself, so I'm I'm down there a bit. I have to go you back have... to work because I'm a very yes. good person. Thank you both so much for being here. I him. I got to go. I love you. I've got hours free. Um <laughs> Talk, I mean, you, keep talking, my friend. We'll, I want to talk about some of your other roles. Um, Dark Knight. Yes. Um, that was good, ex good, good experience. Yeah, very good. But it was an education in the uh, size of the industry because um, doing that job felt like standing by the tracks and a massive locomotive comes past and a hand comes out and picks me up and I travel with the locomotive for a bit and then it drops me off at the next station and goes on to Moscow or wherever it's traveling to. But yeah, that, I mean, that's a production, right? Yeah. Donna, if, yeah. Being on set, oh. looking around and there are like 200, 300 people around. It, it was, wow. you know. Wow, that's that's a lot. But those are, you know, Movies that you know will live on forever. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 one of the few things that I've done that I can bear to watch. Um, Do you not watch yourself? Uh, but Never? it's such a good. 
I mean, it's it, but, and yeah. what this ledger does is so magical. Oh my god! You've gone on. You could, you've have you are you muted? I can't hear no. you. No, you can't hear me. Hello, hello. Oh, there, you're back. Okay, it was Jan it's... messing with us from the other room. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean Heath Ledger. My God. Oh, hey. too, too adorable. Too adorable. Um, is there something you've learned about yourself during this pandemic that you didn't already know? Uh, well, I spent most of last year making some very, very silly videos for YouTube. Um, I'm going to have to go find them. Oh, no, I took them down. Oh. <laughs> I woke up one morning and I realized how silly they were. Uh, but I learned, not only did I learn a lot about storytelling through having to edit little videos and that, but, um, without hopefully without sounding too pompous, I, I think I, I, I think I finally found out what my voice sounds like. And I, I don't mean verbally. I, yeah, I, I know. You know, you're always yeah. looking for, okay, who as a, who am I as a performer, as a, an actor, as an artist? Um, and I think. I think my voice finally crystallized because I had that time to prod at it and make mistakes and that. Um, that was one thing I learned. Uh, the other thing I learned was that um, I love her even more than I thought I did. Uh, um, you know, we've been in each other's company uh, for a, a year and a half now on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. And... Um, and and there's nowhere else I want to be. Yeah, that's a. It, it, I said it to you guys backstage. I mean, it really does let you know you've uh, you're in the right place. You know. I mean, she does betray a slight hint of impatience, and you know, every now and again, every now and again, I know it's time for me to get out from under her feet. We we, we would all be lying if we said it was perfection for right. the year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> it, it would definitely. Um, uh, but it was it's a year and a half and I, I, and I hate sounding Pollyannish about anything but um it's like she's been really cool company for a year and a half you that's know? great to hear that's great to hear so my last question any entertainment that you've uh, thoroughly enjoyed a movie or a film that you know you can recommend to people um oh damn uh Henry James is always good uh, as a novelist. That's if you've got time on your hands. It's mm -hmm. dense, but worth it. Um, and I just plowed through one of his last year, which uh, damn near took most of the year. I'm trying to think <laughs> what else. We've seen such good stuff recently. Like we were saying before, um, uh, previous to the interview, I mean, there's such good stuff out. Yeah, there's so much. Bizarre. Ozark. Uh, Tommy and Ozark. Um, Mank, did you watch Tommy and Mank? No, I haven't seen it yet. Is it any good? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I did. That's kind it, of a qualified idea, yeah? No, I, I did. It, it's a black and white. It, Gary Oldman's fantastic. Tommy's role is smaller than, you know, you know he's not the lead in the movie. But it, I enjoyed the movie very much. It just wasn't like my favorite. But I enjoyed it a lot. Okay. I enjoyed it. It's an inter interesting story. Um and the flight attendant, I really, really enjoyed. Yeah, I, I watched some of it. I think I've got most of it to watch still. Uh, but I was impressed by what I saw. Yeah, I'm just I having mean, a problem. The the this Netflix problem of um, what shall I watch? What shall I watch? Going too to much to choose from, and and I just end up in a state of paralysis because I don't know what to watch. Yeah, it, it, it's true. Well, there's plenty of Star Wars movies to watch. Do you watch them all over? They are dead to me. <laughs> have you have you tried? I assume have have your agent sent you out for them? Um, I trust my agent implicitly, and if there's an opening somewhere, I know they'll be there. Good. Um, well, let's let's keep our fingers crossed. Though I am getting a little closer to accepting that my life might happen without <laughs> being in a Star Wars movie. Okay. Yeah, okay.
It'll be okay. Well, that's a great way to end. This has been so fun catching up with you guys. Likewise, buddy. I hope to see you both in person when this is over. Yeah, that would be lovely. We'll, we'll grab drinks. Yeah. For sure. When, when such a thing is possible once more. When such a thing is possible. I get my first shot tomorrow, so. Oh, really? Yes. yes. Fingers crossed. It goes well. Good job. Yeah. Um, you, All right. When you're gone, I'm going to just sit here and look at the computer and pretend to answer more questions. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave the camera on. I'll be here all uh, evening. Sure. You, you, you'll keep talking to everybody? <laughs> Thanks, Alan. So good. Bye, Richie. So good to see you. You too, bud. Have a, good, have a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget, if you haven't subscribed, do so below and turn on the notifications to be reminded of um, all upcoming shows. And next Friday, uh, Rachel Miner and Brian Buffington will be here. Bye, everybody. <laughs>